think it's time to go. You ready? Okay, off we go. Right, so, so uh, Tom, we only about lattice models. Okay, well, yeah. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about chirality on the lattice. And I'm noticing as I'm watching all the lectures here, uh, I'd forgotten, but of course every year you remember the first week you have a chance to say things that are very simple uh, that people who come along later will build on. Okay, And it was quite by accident, right? You were supposed to be hearing very different things in the first week and I was just supposed to be entertainment. But um, uh, this time I'm, I'm going to be talking today about uh, chirality on the lattice. And this has uh, threads over to uh, major lecture series as we, go, as we go farther into things, things that I don't know anything about, okay? Um, but I'm gonna, so I'm gonna introduce things, but I'm going to do it in, uh, in my sort of old-fashioned particle physics way, uh, kind of QCD-based way. So we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna talk about chirality on the lattice, okay? And the motivation for talking about chiral fermions or talking about fermions in a lattice context um, is first of all because uh, chiral symmetry is an important part of particle physics, okay? Uh, certainly in the kind of things I do for QCD, right? Uh, you have nearly massless fermions and chiral symmetry is spontaneously broken, right? There are Goldstone bosons, the pions. Uh, there are various numbers that are associated with the spontaneous breaking of chiral symmetry like the condensate and the pion decay constant and then all of low energy uh, strong interactions is basically chiral Lagrangians. Uh, chiral symmetry is also explicitly broken, right? The pion is not massless. The pion has a mass of 140 MeV and that's because the up and the down quarks are not quite massless. The kaon is heavier than the pion uh, because the strange quark is heavier than the up and down quarks. And then of course there's the, uh, the anomalous uh, axial singlet current uh, which uh, accounts for the fact that there is another particle, uh, the eta prime, which is not a Goldstone boson, even though it fits in the multiplet, right? Uh, it, it knows about the anomaly and it's sitting up there at 900 MeV, okay? Um, okay, so uh, yeah. So the motivation to talk about chiral symmetry on the lattice is I'm trying to do lattice calculations and uh, it turns out that the simplest formulations of lattice fermions have issues when you come to chiral symmetry, okay? So, wow, uh, fermions and issues have consequences. Um, the issues are going to be, just to write them down right here, is that when you try to do something, either you discover that you, uh, that you lose chiral symmetry, or you have something called the doubling problem. Okay? And, a cons and um, remember, I'm, you know, for us the lattice, okay, we're not, we're not condensed matter physicists, so for us the lattice is a fake, okay? And, um, and yet, if the actual way that we discretize everything costs us chiral symmetry, and then if I observe that chiral symmetry is broken in a simulation, is it really broken in QCD or is it broken because I was stupid in how I discretized everything? That's the problem that we have. Um, issues have consequences, and so uh, if you have a formulation of uh, fermions uh, which doesn't know about chiral symmetry, then you have, typically you have fine tuning problems. Uh, so uh, I dial into my simulation uh, some lattice value for the quark mass and then the physical value of the quark mass is additively renormalized, okay, because there's no chiral symmetry. And so when I do a simulation, uh, I, have to, I have to do fine tuning, okay, uh, uh, in order to land the quark mass where it is. Um, another issue here is that uh, if, you're, if your action is not chiral and you want to measure a matrix element of some, some operator that has a particular chiral behavior, okay, it can mix with operators of different chirality and it might be that the mixing term washes out the thing that you want to look at, right? And you know, things, things mix, that's life, okay? So operator mixing. Um, doubling, I'll show you in just a second, but one consequence when you try to cure the doubling problem, uh, you discover things like your pions 
uh, aren't degenerate. Uh, basically, the lattice gives you crystal fields which, which, which breaks uh, things which should be degenerate apart. Okay? Um, and so you, would, you don't want to deal with these things. They're, they're annoying. Okay? Um, a second motivation uh, for thinking about uh, chirality on the lattice is, uh, okay, let's back up. QCD is a vector gauge theory, right? The left-handed and right-handed fermions couple equally to gluons. The standard model, right, is a chiral gauge theory, right? Left-handed fermions see the W plus and the W minus, right-handed fermions don't, okay? Um, nice thing about lattice is a non-perturbative regulator. I can talk about QCD outside of the context of perturbation theory. Uh, might be interesting, even though it's probably not phenomenologically important, to have some non-perturbative regulator for the standard model or for possible extensions of the standard model. Uh, there are disreputable phenomenologists who imagine that there is some new dynamics out there to replace the Higgs boson and, you know, when you can't do anything else, it's non-perturbative, okay? Uh, but if you don't have a non-perturbative regulator, maybe you shouldn't be talking about things like that. So it's an interesting uh, question of principle, okay? Can I come up with some sort of non-perturbative regulator for a chiral gauge theory? And I'll talk about that at the end, although in all honesty, I am absolutely not an expert in that subject. It's really a subject which should be discussed while you're all holding glasses of beer, okay? Um, but if you could solve that problem, you would be famous. Okay, um, motivation for this lecture is, um, Okay, for lattice people, this is an old subject. I would say for the last 20 or 25 years, people have known how to implement chiral fermions uh, on the lattice when the interactions are vector interactions, okay? And it's a solved problem. I've got codes, other people in the room have got codes that do this, okay? And what we do is a mix of five-dimensional ideas and four-dimensional ideas. Five-dimensional ideas is like all the three-dimensional stuff which is about to wash over you uh, in this TASI, okay? At the same time, there's a parallel development in the condensed matter literature, right? Topological insulators, okay? And there's all this story in topological insulators. You're there in three dimensions and you have this two-dimensional edge states and da 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 da, okay? The, um, the language superficially between what we lattice people do for chiral fermions and what the topological insulator guys, big parts of that language looks very similar. Okay, but then there are big parts of it that look very different. And I've been trying to read the condensed matter literature, but I have a problem. I don't know the phenomenology very well. The language is just different. It's like me struggling in the back of the room this week. Okay, I don't know any mathematics. Okay, um, I suspect that there are things that we know that they don't know. I suspect that there are things that they don't that they know that we don't know. Uh, I suspect there's a possibility to write really cheap papers. Okay. Again, you can become famous if you can do the translation, okay? Uh, I cannot do the translation, but I can tell you what, we're, what we know about uh, to deal with chirality on the lattice, and then you can take it and run with it, okay? Now, it turns out that there are two versions of the story, okay? Uh, there's a five-dimensional version of the story and a four-dimensional version of the story, okay? So let's, I wrote down some things up here because I didn't feel like copying them. So let's look at this blackboard right here. So I'm just looking at a continuum uh, massless fermion action and the associated propagator. Okay, so let's look at this guy. I'm going to say very simple things. This guy's got a pole at p mu is equal to zero. There's a single singularity, right? So we would look at this thing and we would say, well, this is the propagator for a single fermion. Okay. Uh, it's, it's a chiral, uh, the action is chiral in the sense that the, that the Dirac oper anti operator anti-commutes with gamma 5, or if you want to talk about chiral rotations, you know, chapter 3 of Peskin and Schroeder, uh, same thing, you could put projectors on both sides and project out positive or negative helicity, all the simple stuff, right? That's, that's the continuum, okay? So the issue is when you want to put uh, the fermion on the lattice, you have to replace the derivative by a finite difference, okay? So over here, I've, writ I've just replaced the derivative by, uh, by a symmetric difference, because that's a nice thing to do, and then I've calculated the free particle propagator 
in momentum space. And of course, the P just turned into a sine P because I have a difference right there, okay? Now, look at the denominator, okay? The denominator has got zeros when P mu is equal to zero, just like over here. Oh, and by the way, minus pi over A less than, right, your Brion zone, uh, less than pi over A, and we have a lot of mathematicians in here, so I'll chop one of these guys. This guy's got poles at p mu is equal to zero, but it also has singularities at p mu is equal to pi over a. That is, there's one place in momentum space where this guy has a zero. There are 16 places where this guy has a zero. Zero, 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 pi, zero, zero, pi, pi, da, 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 okay? So if you're counting sort of places where you know you have poles uh, to count the number of particles. This is not one fermion. This is 16 fermions, okay? This is the doubling problem. This guy is doubled, okay? Uh, you have your own language, right? That there are, this is, a, this is a lattice action which corresponds to 16 continuum fermions, okay? Um, look at the numerator. It's still chiral, right? You know, this guy, the action, and he commutes with gamma phi. Oh, shit. Uh, there's a gamma mu up here. Good. There we go. The action, uh, and he commutes with gamma phi. You could put projectors on this guy. This guy is chiral, OK? But he's doubled, OK? So that's, 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 uh, that's an example of this guy right here. Well, you could say, I want to get back from 16 down to 1, okay? And I want to do it in a benign way. So what I will do over here, this is called a Wilson fermion. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add, a, I'm going to add an irrelevant operator to the mix. This is A over 2 psi bar del squared psi. A is the lattice spacing, okay? So it's a higher derivative operator, but I multiplied it by the lattice spacing. So in the continuum limit, right, this guy is irrelevant. Uh, what the second derivative does is to lift the modes. I mean, this guy only has a zero at p mu is equal to zero. This is one fermion, but you can already see there's a gamma mu here and there's a one here, right? So this guy's not chiral. It's an explicit breaking of chiral symmetry, explicit breaking by irrelevant operators, but it's still explicit, okay? So, and that's this guy right here. Um, there is a famous theorem called the nielsen ninomiya theorem. Uh, nielsen. Which condensed matter physicists who do topological insulators know about, okay, and now you know about it too, which basically says that under some rather broad uh, a set of assumptions, okay, basically that your Dirac operator looks like I gamma mu d mu, you know, for, for, for low momentum, uh, and that it's not that the Dirac operator, uh, you know, that the dispersion relation is, doesn't have a discontinuity in it like, uh, like Slava was talking about, uh, and whatnot, that you're screwed, okay? Either you have an action which is which is non-chiral, okay, and not at, which is which is which is not doubled, which is good, but it's not chiral, which is bad. Or you have an action which is doubled, uh, which is bad, but it's chiral, which is good. There's a hole in the theorem, which we'll come back to, okay. But this is the story right here, okay. Uh, yeah, the the hole in the thing, by the way, I should add, just say in words, is um, all this works if you have a uh, a charge, a chiral charge, which is quantized. That is, as I move around in the baryon zone, right, uh, my fermion has got chiral charge equal to minus one or one or something like that, okay? Sounds technical, but useful. Okay, so there are a couple of ways to evade this guy. There's a 5D way, and there's a 4D way. So let's look at the five-dimensional one, because that's the closest to things you're gonna get lectures about, okay? Um, so chirality in five dimensions.
Okay, um, I would say this goes all the way back to Jakeef and Rebbe in 76. And there's a famous paper by Callan and Harvey in 85, give or take. Uh, and then the famous lattice paper that I know about is by Dave Kaplan in 92. Okay? Um, and the physics of this story is the following thing, is that if you have, say, fermions that talk to a scalar field, and if the scalar field uh, has a profile as a function of, that basically if the scalar field supports a soliton, okay, so you interpolate from one vacuum to another vacuum, there is a state, there is a fermion which is stuck to the side of the soliton. That's the physics, okay? Okay, and there's a lot of different guises for it, uh, but this is, these guys way back then, and there are condensed matter systems. Are you going to talk about polyacetylene? No. There are condensed matter systems uh, where, this, where you can see this, and they are very peculiar things. They have uh, the wrong charge for their spin, okay? So they're kind of fun. Um, okay, so what did Kaplan do? Uh, what he said was, let's do it the free field version of these things. Let's imagine that we have some five-dimensional Dirac operator which is a four-dimensional Dirac operator plus gamma 5 d5 minus some mass profile m of s, which is a profile that looks like this. And the four right here, uh, this is, call this x, and we have a set of mu is equal to 1 to 4. The fifth dimension, uh, I'm going to call the distance in the fifth dimension s, and then 5 is 5, okay? And then d4, for the time being, is just free field theory, gamma mu d mu, okay? And this is my profile m of s sitting right here. s is a distance in the fifth dimension. What I have is a coordinate in the fifth dimension, okay? And so uh, imagine a world uh, so this side right here is our four-dimensional space, and the fifth dimension is going left to right on the blackboard. Okay? Time is not the uh, I'm in Euclidean space. Okay? One, two, three, four, five. I, and I make no promises that I'll even get the metric right. Okay? I'm going to write down some minus sign things here. Uh, okay. So just five-dimensional Euclidean space. Uh, I've got fields that exist in five dimensions. Uh, I've got you know, the right number of Dirac matrices in five dimensions because I've got a gamma five. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to artificially, okay, I'm going to put in a mass term which varies in the fifth dimension. Okay? Um, and, uh, yeah, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to solve the Dirac equation d5, say, chi is equal to zero uh, with the presumption that my spinner, x and s, I'm just stating the problem right here, is some free particle in four dimensions times some spinner which moves around in five dimensions. Okay? And by the way, uh, p, I'm, is say, i e comma p vector and p squared uh, is equal to minus e squared plus p vector squared is minus m squared when I solve things. And I have no idea how I ended up with gravity metric because, uh, well, I'm in, I'm in Euclidean space. Okay, the hell with it. I don't do minus signs. Okay, um, now, this is a problem whose solution you have seen. You have seen it in Boulder, Colorado. You saw it on Monday, right? This is Clay's lecture, okay? Uh, and the physics of this is that you usually have two solutions except when you can't. And then you get one solution. The difference between what he was doing on Monday and what I'm doing now is he'll be talking about uh, 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 fermions and bosons, and I will be talking about left-handed particles and right-handed particles. But it's simply a, a, a global substitution of words. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve uh, gamma 5 d5 uh, minus m uh, or d5 
minus m. No, I'm going to keep the derivative right here. I'm going to, I'm going to, I've separated variables, okay? Minus m of s times u is equal to minus i p slash times u, okay? And this will give me my solution right here. So I, I have some plane wave in, in, in our four dimensional space, and I have some, you know, some spinner which is different as I move around in the fifth dimension, okay? Okay, bitty, 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 bitty. I can square this guy up, okay? So let's do that first and identify the solutions, okay? So I'm going to get something when I square this guy, let's say d, d squared, which is equal to minus d5 squared plus v, right? The squared differential operator is going to look like this. Uh, and v is equal to, Clay is wincing because he says it much better than me. I have never heard the word super sub I have never seen any card carrying lattice person ta who talks about domain wall fermions or Kaplan fermions ever utter the word supersymmetric quantum mechanics. Okay? I don't want to say that no one ever has. But I've never heard that. So let's no lattice person who has ever coded anything has used those words in a sentence. Okay? David Kaplan probably knows this very well. Okay, so this is what this is the differential operator, and we're interested in the spectrum. Okay, so good. We know, I just have to write down what the answer is. Let's pause and look at what this guy is right here. Right, m. Let's say looks like this. So that says that m squared looks like this, and then I have a d five m that looks like this. Right. Because take the derivative, right? Zero, big, zero, okay? And that says that my potential looks either like this if I have one sign for gamma five, or it looks like this if I have the other sign for gamma five, right? This is gamma, this is, and by the way, uh, V commutes with gamma five, and so I can work in a gamma five basis. I'm just telling you things that uh, Clay told you two days ago, okay? So it's instant gratification that somebody listened to his lecture. Okay? Good. So this guy, okay, the Dirac equation has got two kinds of solutions. Okay? Um, it's got solutions where this side of the equation is non-zero, where p is some non-zero number. Okay? Those solutions will have mass squared, right, when I square things up, I'll get d squared, you know, d squared u is equal to m squared u. Little m squared is going to be equal to big m squared because that's the only scale in the problem. So it's a whole series of excitations of the, you know, solutions of the Dirac equation which have non-zero eigenvalues. And they're up around, you know, they have, they have solutions. So there are, yeah, let's see, this is going to get bad. There are, And all the time, in the, in the back of my mind, as a lattice person, I'm thinking that capital M is up there in the sky. Because for me, it's going to be like one over the lattice spacing. This is way up there, no universality, no funny business. This is just some Dirac equation I'm fiddling around with. Okay? That'll be the eigenvalue. Yeah, let me fill, let me fill in something right here. So I'm going to be doing something like, right, I'm solving, where the hell did it go? Yeah, uh, I'm solving this guy up here. So that I'm, I want to solve this equation, and I'll have solutions where p squared is equal to m squared, solving the eigenvalue equation. Okay, and I'm clearly interested in the p squared values here because that's the p of the. I want to know what the dispersion relation is, you know, in the four-dimensional world. Okay, so I'm going to have solutions in the four-dimensional world, which are basically massive particles. And then these guys extend into the fifth dimension, and there's some funny set of solutions in the fifth dimension, you know, which I get from solving this thing right here. Okay? And little m is equal to big M. You know, there could be, there could be uh, a continuum of states, there could be bound states. But it doesn't matter. They're all up there. They're heavy. Okay? 
So we don't care about them. But just like last time, there are solutions with p slash u is equal to 0. Okay? And you know that from Wednesday. Okay? And these guys are solutions to the equation gamma 5 uh, d5 minus m times u is equal to 0. Okay? These are massless modes. Okay? And these guys have a solution uh, where uh, let's introduce chiral projectors, say p plus or minus v is equal to v to get the spinners in there. These are solutions in the fifth dimension, u of s, which are equal to, this is, this is Monday, okay, plus or minus integral dt from 0 to s, uh, m of t, close brackets, times v. So what I have is a chiral spinner, and then this is the form of the wave function in the fifth dimension. Okay? Plus or minus for plus or minus chirality, okay, positive or negative helicity states, okay? An integral right here. And what's the punchline? You have a question, but I want to get the punchline out first. Okay. Yeah, these are the projectors. This is uh, 1 plus or minus gamma 5 over 2. Sorry. Uh, plus or minus, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because I want to have chiral states. These are, these are solutions that are chiral. Okay. Uh, and notice, right, I have this integral right here. So depending on the sign of the kink, in, Uh, I want, yeah, I want to be an eigenvector of gamma function. So p plus of v is v and p minus of v is v. Yeah. Shall I say p minus or plus of v is equal to zero? So I project them out? Okay. Uh, good. So, so the physics, okay. Depending on the sign of the kink, I can get a solution which is normalizable, or I don't get a solution which is normalizable. Okay? So what happens here is, let's erase all the, let's find an eraser and get the nice thing back here again, is I've got a chiral fermion stuck to a domain wall. Okay? So what I've got is uh, let's run it along here. Let's suppose that m of s looks like this as a function of s. I've got a solution sitting right here and with m of s shaped like this, this is a left-handed mode, okay? And it's a massless mode uh, and it lives at this location in the fifth dimension. And then if it should happen that this guy were to come down over here, I could have another massless mode sitting out here at some other value of s. And because of the shape of this thing, this would be a right-handed mode. And if I was a condensed matter physicist, I could imagine bringing, in living in five dimensions, I could bring it back up and get another left-handed mode. But I'm not going to do that. Okay? So what you've got here, and it's the same algebra that we had last time. You, you get, and of course, uh, there's no particularly interesting chirality with all the massive modes, okay? Uh, you could say that they are paired, but it doesn't matter because they're all up there in the sky, okay? They're heavy. We have these uh, massless particles stuck to domain walls, okay? Um, I could be pedantic, right? I could write down a five-dimensional action. I could expand my field in eigenmodes, you know, do separation. It's a Jackson problem, okay? Uh, orthogonality, bitty, 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 you know, Jackson chapter 3, I could write down a four-dimensional four effective action. Okay? It would consist of massless fermions, which would be stuck to the domain walls, massive, you know, and then massive guys. Well, I've, I've integrated over these guys right here. I, have, I would have a tower of, you know, I'd have massless states, which are chiral, and massive states. Who cares? Because they're heavy. And now, think physically, right? 
Uh, I'm interested in really, really low energy excitation. So I'm going to come in and tap my system with a, with a hammer, but a very, very light hammer. Okay. Uh, you propagate through the things that like to propagate. So you're only propagating through the, through the near zero modes, through the chiral modes. Okay. Um, okay. Um, this was Kaplan. This was 1992. If you go back and read these old papers, okay, uh, you know, we, we live in buzzwords. God, I know that, okay, because you speak a different language than I do, okay, I'm struggling to hang on. If you read those old papers, the word topology was not a magic word 25 years ago, okay? Nowadays, people come in, hey, oh, it's, you know, topological uh, state, right? Now, they, okay, you can say it better than I can. But, but people knew, even though there's not a magic word, people knew, okay, that the picture that I sketch right here uh, is pretty much independent, you know, pretty much stable against changes in my potential. You know, I can wiggle it, I can move it around. What's really important, I mean, the topology is that I've got edges. I've got these things that flip, you know, I've got solitons running around, okay? That's the interesting physics. The presence of these solitons is what gives us the chiral modes. Way back in 1976, uh, Jakeef and Rebbe, these were real honest-to-God solitons, okay? They were looking at, I don't know, fermions talking to scalars, and then you just put in a kink, because back in the 70s, everybody was doing solitons, okay? And then you had the states, uh, and the condensed matter physicists would call them mid-gap states. They would say that these massive guys are in the valence band or the conduction band. And uh, if Bob Schrieffer was not famous already, he would have been famous for working on polyacetylene then. Okay, there was a big industry on that. Okay, so people knew everything is stable against these uh, variations. Okay, okay, good. So that takes us, so now if you should happen to get lost at an APS meeting and go into uh, a section where there are QCD people and they are doing what are called domain wall fermions, okay, uh, topology would be at work, okay? Um, because what happens is, so this was Kaplan's suggestion, okay? Take a lattice, go into five dimensions, make it periodic in the fifth dimension, nail down a kink someplace, nail down an anti-kink someplace. I mean, you have to do that because you have to code things up. That's a little bit expensive. So, uh, so this was Kaplan. Okay, and a couple of years later, uh, a very smart person named Yigal Shamir uh, invented the kind of fermion that exists in simulations everywhere. And what he did was to take this guy right here and snip it, okay, and take these two ends and sew them together, okay, and Shall I show my ignorance or that I can use mathematical jargon and say the word uh, orbifold? Okay, and I'll run away from that. What you do is you take S and you make S compact, okay, and then you put, when you tie these guys together, you have boundary conditions here which basically coupling the uh, left-handed mode at S is equal to, I don't know, L sub S. Let's go. So S is running around like this. And 2 uh, S is equal to L. So your Dirac operator, uh, let's say D plus equals uh, something like M psi bar P, say, psi 0 P L psi L. Going, you know, going around the road world right there, plus m psi bar l p right. These are left and right projectors uh, psi zero. So what I'm doing is I'm taking these guys, plugging them together. Okay. Uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm going to do zero less than s less than, let's say, L sub S. Let's put an L sub S right here, L sub S, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my fifth dimension, okay? I'm going to make it a finite interval, okay? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my differential equation and I'm going to put down boundary conditions, okay, such that the field over here 
uh, is coupled to the field over here off the edge. That wasn't there originally. With something, see, I have my left-handed fermion sitting here and my right-handed fermion sitting here. And what I'm going to do, I'm going uh, to tie these guys together to make a Dirac fermion just by coupling them together. Okay. Right. That, that's, how I, that's how I have this light Dirac fermion. Yes, sir. No. Why not? Can uh, the he says, how big is the lattice spacing? Okay. <laughs> or how, how big is the fifth dimension? That's an, en that's an engineering question. Okay. That is an engineering question. Let me, let me draw a picture here, which will, let me say one or two more things, and then uh, I will answer your question. Okay. So, um, Shamir was immediately headed for the lattice. Okay. So he went away from all of this free field stuff that I was writing down, okay? So, okay, I erased it, I'm stupid. But there was this Dirac operator D4, okay, that I plugged in. You know, I have a, a four-dimensional Dirac operator that carries me around on the, on the face of things, okay? Um, in order to make this work, you don't want to have doubling, okay? That's the game. The game is to avoid, you know, you want to have no doubling and you want to have, chi and you want to have a chiral fermion. So what you do is you take an undoubled action right here, okay? So you have your derivative term, which is what we were playing around with, and then you have all this crap over here, which is kind of like a funny mass term, okay? So what you do is you take this four derivative guy. This is some undoubled lattice action. Oh, and by the way, uh, remember when I wrote it down, right, this is, you know, four dimensions, right, is this transverse thing, okay? So what you do is you discretize your fifth dimension, say S is equal to 0, 1, 2, I don't know, let's call it N sub S right here. Um, what you do is you, you have to get gauge fields into the problem. You have four dimensional gauge fields. which live on the four-dimensional slices, and it's the same gauge field here and here and here and here because it's a four-dimensional action. You're not doing five-dimensional quantum field theory. It's a, it's a construction, okay? So you could think about it in five dimensions that I have, I don't know, u is equal to one, but there's no kinetic terms that connect these guys. These guys are completely decoupled. If I, if I turn the fermions off, I'm just doing n sub s copies. Everybody, you know, it's like playing chords on a piano when I update things. So the gauge fields in the fifth dimension are trivial. Okay? And then what I will discover when I do this is I will have, uh, say, a left-handed mode whose wave function is falling off exponentially as I go into the fifth dimension. Okay? And I have a right-handed mode which is falling off exponentially as I go into the fifth dimension. Okay? And if my spacing is not big enough, the left-handed mode and the right-handed mode will overlap, right? I've got exponential decay going in this way. I've got exponential decay going in this way, OK? And so it's an engineering question. How big do I have to make these things in order to have a chiral fermion? And the way people address that, one of the ways people can address that is I simulate one of these guys and then I measure something like the axial ward identity quark mass, right? You know, I, I, I imagine looking at, say, the matrix element of, of the derivative of, say, d0 of the axial current uh, between pion states, and this is equal to mq times the matrix element of the pseudoscalar current. Uh, this is a pion right here, okay? I have some something which tells me about chiral symmetry that involves a quark mass, okay? And this is, this is, you know, I'm measuring this thing, I'm doing simulations, I'm doing simulations, the ratio of these things tells me what the effective quark mass is. And then I can ask, well, I dialed a quark mass in, you know, because I, I control the first line of my computer program, and what do I get out? This is called the residual quark mass. It's a lattice artifact, okay? And the answer to your question is, I try to figure out how small should this be in order to do the physics that I want to do. And then I have to adjust the, fi the, fifth, the size of the fifth dimension accordingly. And now we go off into engineering, okay? Uh, and the engineering is, 
how small do I want to make this thing? And then can I invent clever, you know, now we're into you know, serious software engineering. Can I invent very clever discretizations of things uh, to make this fifth dimension as small as I can? And for you guys, this is totally uninteresting. Okay? I mean, this is like, okay, this, this is like big chunks of things that you guys do. I don't want to know. Okay? But, um, but uh, I mean, this is a project I'm working on right now with, uh, with a friend of mine. You know, how do we do it better and better? Right? So state of the art is what? Uh, Oliver, you know, because you do this for a living. Uh, what? No, how big? Slava wants to know how big is the fifth dimension? 16 is a common Six, 16 sites. Okay, so it's 16 times as expensive as a standard algorithm, but on the other hand, the chiral symmetry is, maybe, you know, it's much better. Okay, so that's, now we're into engineering. But this is the story right here. Okay, uh, and these are what are called domain wall fermions. Okay. So they are edge states. Your chiral fermions are edge states. Um, yes, sir? So the, in the Schmier construction, the ends, that's the MQ in the phrase? So, 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 yeah. So what happens is, let's, 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 yeah. So the question is, in the Shamir construction, uh, let's put a tilde on this right here. There is a bare quark mass that I dial into the simulation, or that I dial into my bare action, OK? And then I can ask, what is the actual quark mass that comes out? And the formula is something like, OK, this is, this is artistic, OK? MQ is MQ tilde something like, uh, I don't know, e to the minus MQ L, uh, LS divided by 1 minus e to the minus uh, mqls. It's a solvable problem, OK? So there's, there's a renormalization, OK? So the output mass, is the, the, the shifted mass is, is proportional to what you dial in. There's a z factor. The output mass is nearly proportional to the mass that you put in. It's, it's multiplicative renormalized. This is far too technical for me to be talking about here. OK, yeah, but you can keep going. When I integrate out the bulk, yes. mm -hmm. don't I get a kinetic term for A that's proportional to LS? Uh, you, yes, now when you integrate out the bulk terms, do you get dirt, he's asking. OK, and the answer is yes. But it's something you can control. OK, and this is a word that I've seen in, 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 in the literature from your kind of things. You can add to your theory extra scalar fields with, this, with basically the square of the Dirac operator. Okay? These are called pauli velars regulator fields. Okay? And remember, when you integrate over scalars, you get a determinant to one power. And when you integrate over fermions, you get a determinant to the other power. Okay? So that's how you can cancel effects like that. And I've had people walk up to me and say, oh, domain wall fermions are tremendous because you, you don't get any uh, renormalization of the gauge field coupling from the fermions because of all these poly, poly velars fields. I have not done that myself, but that's a trick you can do. Yeah, there, th this is nasty, OK? It's, it's a whole long series of technical things that you have to solve. But they are just technical things. They are not deep, OK? Good. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, these are domain wall fermions. You can see they are very similar to edge states. Okay, I mean they are edge states right here. They live on the edge, and then you have these gauge fields in the bulk. I am not competent to talk about Chern-Simons currents. Okay, you will have people here who are much more competent than I. Okay, um, but I call your attention uh, the Callan and Harvey paper. Right, uh, you know anomalies. They really depend on ultraviolet physics. They're weird, goddamn things. Okay. And lattice, that's completely different. Um, but there is a paper by Kaplan, Janssen, and Martin Goltermann uh, from around 1993 that David Kaplan really, really loves. He wants everybody to read this paper, where he shows that the five-dimensional anomaly equation works for these things just the way it does in the continuum. And I just tell you about it. I am not competent to say more. What I am competent to tell you about is something that I think the condensed matter physicists don't know about. And that's a formulation of chiral fermions in four dimensions. Okay? Uh, and I've never seen 
anybody talk about this, anybody who is not a lattice person, but I think it's way cool. I have computer programs uh, that simulate this kind of fermion, and I can tell you, okay, you can take my computer program and you can code up uh, a gauge field configuration for an instanton, and you can put that gauge field configuration on your computer, and you can calculate, you can compute the index, okay, in the sense of fermion eigenvalues on that instanton, and if you don't get one, your computer program has a bug, okay? So that's way cool, okay? So I'm gonna tell you about that. There's a magic word, there are two magic words, okay? There is something called the Ginsparg Wilson uh, relation. And this is the thing I have not found in the topological insulator literature, but I'm not very smart, okay? Uh, and the rule, okay? Very important rule for theoretical physics, okay? To evade a theorem, change the rules. Okay, so what is chirality? Gamma 5 D plus D gamma 5, standard definition of chirality, what is this equal to for a chiral action? I need a continuum guinea pig. Gamma 5 and zero. zero, yes. Okay, so the way that you evade it is you add, you make this not equal to zero, but equal to something which is zero as the lattice spacing goes to zero. This is the Ginsburg-Wilson relation. Let me write things down in terms of chiral rotations, okay? So what this says is that the chiral rotation for psi, one way to write it, delta psi is I epsilon gamma five uh, delta Let's write down delta psi bar is I epsilon psi bar gamma five. So that's your usual chiral rotation for psi bar. And for this guy, one minus A over R zero D times psi, okay? Remember, right, psi and psi bar are just different things in the functional integral. And what you're doing here is you're slightly altering what you mean by the chiral rotation you are making the chiral rotation a little bit non, a little bit smeared out. I don't want to say non-local, right? This is a Dirac operator. It's a local object, you know, exponential locality, blah, blah, blah. But what you're doing is you're, you know, I take this guy and I do a chiral rotation and I smear it out a little bit at non-zero lattice spacing. Clearly as A goes to zero, it's the same thing. This is, this is the analog of the Ginsburg-Wilson relation. Okay. This, relation right here has an extremely funny history, okay? And I'm gonna tell you about it because we have plenty of time, okay? So, this thing was written down by Paul Ginsparg when he was Ken Wilson's graduate student back in 1981, okay? And way back then, uh, Wilson had a number of students who were doing Wilson renormalization group, okay? including, by the way, Michael Peskin, okay? Maybe the Cornell people know that because they've looked at his thesis, but everybody else, you know, you think he was, do I don't know what you think he was doing, uh, but that's what he was doing, okay? So, what Ginsburg and Wilson were doing long, long ago, okay, uh, 1981, they were doing real space renormalization group, okay? So, to draw a cartoon, Imagine that you have some action which is defined, you know, deep, deep, deep in the ultraviolet. It's some psi bar d psi and it's chiral, okay? So here we are, you know, we have, you know, you're in the back of the room. So this is my, you know, I've got some action defined here, okay? And what you're gonna start doing is you're gonna start, you know, doing some sort of a block spin or integrating things out uh, to define your psi fields, say smeared over things about this big. Right, you're doing real space RG, okay? I'll write down a formula because people like formulas here, okay? So I start off with the partition function, which is d psi, d psi bar, uh, e to the minus s of psi bar and psi, 
and then I integrate, I integrate, I introduce some new fields, say psi bar L psi L, and I multiply by some weighting function of psi L, psi bar L, uh, psi, and psi bar. Okay? And this gives me an action in terms of d psi L, uh, d psi L, e to the minus s prime of psi L, psi L bar. Okay? What I'm doing is I'm thinning out uh, short distance physics to construct some kind of an action that involves psi fields that are averaged right over space. Okay? Right? You know about Wilson, Wilsonian RG, right? Please say yes. You do. Okay. Maybe you've even done it. Okay? Uh, you should think about it. I mean, this is really, you know, you're thinning out ultraviolet degrees of freedom and you're leaving yourself with infrared degrees of freedom. Now, if you have a symmetry defined at your shortest distance scale, here is a trivia question for you, and you do some sort of a renormalization group transformation, okay? So you define new variables which are averages of your old variables. What happens to the symmetry? Does it go away? Or does it merely hide? Sure. Huh? It stays put. Exactly. Okay? Although it hides. Okay? Because you have these fields that are defined over some big region. Okay? And so what Ginsberg and Wilson did was to imagine that on the shortest distance scale, I had an action that was chiral. Okay, so gamma 5 anti commutes with the Dirac operator. And then I start integrating over things. And my renormalization group transformation was not chiral. It was something like, it was something that didn't look chiral at all, but you're still smearing things. Okay? And what they got for the, for the, this is for the blocked action. This is for the effective low energy action of the fermions. Okay? It was chiral in this sense right here, that no longer were these smeared out guys chiral in the sense that this is zero. This was your relation, okay? And it's an amazing paper. Uh, let me tell you what happened to it, and then I'll tell you things that were in that paper, okay? The paper was forgotten. The paper was written in 1981. Before 1997, it had 11 citations, okay? Ginsberg went off to, you know, to do computer programming. Okay? In 1997, okay, Peter Hasenfratz, a great man, I learned, he, he really raised, okay, I worked with him for a while. I, he, there was nobody else who raised the bar I had to really deliver. He was, he was picky. Okay? Anyhow, we were doing things similar to this. We were working on something called perfect actions. And he was off visiting someplace and he was cleaning out a filing cabinet. Okay? And he found the Ginsberg and Wilson paper. I am not making this up. And I can remember when he sent me the email, okay, he was a Hungarian, he was not a native speaker of English. He, he said, it's like opening Pandora's box, okay? And I remember reading this paper, and it's the one time in my life, okay, you read a paper and you can't believe what you're reading, but you know what the next sentence is, okay? And you read the next sentence, and you can't believe what you're reading, and you read the next sentence, and you're thinking, I could have written this paper, except I'm stupid, okay? And you go on and on, okay? Because those guys, they worked out the anomaly, okay? They showed that the anomaly works, okay? And they showed all of current algebra, okay? Everything worked, 1981. 11 citations in 18 years, forgotten, okay? Right, dustbin of history, okay? Why was it forgotten? The reason, oh, and now, okay? It's a renowned paper. It's got over a thousand citations. Okay? I mean, it's, it's famous. Okay? In our line of work. Okay. What was the problem? Okay? The problem was that Ginsberg and Wilson did not have an explicit form for the Dirac operator. What they had was uh, basically some implicit construction uh, in a very kind of blocky kind of a way. Okay? They didn't have something you could actually write down and code. It was, it, was, it was murky, okay? So it's a great idea, but I can't do anything with it, okay? So, um, so um, what caused the thing to get 1,000 citations is somebody else, okay? 
Um, you needed to have an explicit form of the operator right here, and that was provided by uh, Herbert Neuberger and Rajamani Narayanan. They came at this game in a completely different way, which I'm not telling you about. See, the thing about five dimensions, the anomaly is a queer goddamn thing, right? Chiral symmetry breaking, you know, the infinite elevator problem. You've got to have a lot of fields out there, okay? We have a lot of fields because we're in the, you know, the fifth dimension, right? You know, you're going out forever, okay? They didn't talk about fifth dimension. They just talk about infinite number of regulator fields. Another thing which I, and it was, it's, it's, the other thing I have to warn you about, when you're writing a paper and you're being revolutionary, think about your audience, okay? Uh, nobody who did lattice simulations for a living appreciated that paper because they could not understand it, okay? I'm an old guy, and okay, you should turn the, you know, turn, okay, I don't care. He, he already doesn't like me. When you're writing something, think about your audience, okay? Old guy advice, okay? And what they did, but what they did was they had an operator, they had an operator that worked, R0 over A, following thing, 1 plus, I'll write it down, gamma 5 epsilon of H. I'll tell you what this means in a second. And I'll write it down, R0 over A, 1 plus D divided by D dagger D. Let's close brackets. Where D is some four-dimensional action with a negative mass. The mass is minus R0 over A. And H is the Hermitian Dirac operator, gamma 5 D. Okay, that's the Hermitian Dirac operator. This is the matrix step function. Okay, this is like, you know, you know, a step function is minus one and then one. Okay, I'm just telling you what it is. I mean, this is something you could write down. Coding this thing, it's a problem from hell. Okay, but this is an exact realization of this business over here. Okay. So, so what happens here is epsilon of h. Suppose that you, that you uh, apply the matrix step function. Uh, suppose that you have a function which is an eigenvalue of the, which is an eigenfunction of the Hermitian Dirac operator. Okay? So I have h phi is equal to lambda phi. Then epsilon of h times phi is epsilon of lambda times phi. Right? And there is a literature on the matrix step function. Okay? R0 is a parameter, okay? It's this parameter right here. What is it physically? Let me tell you, some, let me say some things about it. Before. Okay, I'll jump ahead. It turns out that this guy uh, has the following spectrum. Let me write it over here, okay? That the Ginsburg-Wilson relation means that the spectrum of the Dirac operator, uh, let's plot it on the complex plane right here, is the following thing. The spectrum of eigenvalues is a circle of radius R0 over A. The eigenvalues live on a circle. It turns out that the eigenvalues here and here are chiral. If you have, say, uh, how should I say it? If, if, you have, uh, if you have psi, if you have gamma 5 psi is equal to plus or minus psi, I leave it for a homework assignment right here then it turns out that the eigenvalues are either 0 or 2R0 over A, and the rest of the eigenvalues are not chiral. There are the complex conjugate guys are, you know, they're mixed chirality, okay? So, and this is 0, no screwing around, okay? That's your index theorem, okay? This thing knows about an index theorem, and I didn't say anything about FF dual or anything like that. If you look at the if you look at the Dirac, you know, you do a Fujikawa business, you know, you play around with things and you assume that everything is very smooth, okay, so that you can replace lattice differences by derivatives. You can show that the, that the derivative of the, you know, that the divergence of the, of the singlet axial current is in fact FF dual. But this is true uh, regardless of your discretization. Okay, so these are four-dimensional fermions. And let's just go ahead and write the index theorem right here. Q is equal to n plus minus n minus, okay? I can go off and take some random gauge configuration, and I calculate the spectrum of this operator, okay? You know, the Dirac spectrum, and I count the number of plus modes minus the number of minus modes, and that's, that's a number. That's an integer. That's Q. Okay, now, I have not seen this in the four-dimensional 
but it's got to be. There's got to be something like that there, okay? There's got to be. But I, 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 I can't. I mean. I mean, Kramer's degeneracy. I mean, God. I mean, you know, it's all this stuff I don't know about in the in the in the condensed matter literature. But I'm old. You're young. Okay. Now, what's the connection? It turns out that there is a connection between the Ginzburg-Wilson relation and five-dimensional fermion relation. Okay. And what happens is what. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. How how do you code this? Okay. So I have to calc. Let's look at this guy. So I have to calculate this guy right here. Okay. So I have to calculate the inverse square root of the square of some operator. Number of ways of doing that. The typical way that you do it is to you know is to think about a formula something like one over x to the p is something like a product of x minus q j. Uh, you know, x minus pj. Think about Chebyshev polynomials or n over d or something like that, right? You know, you find some rational function approximation to the to things to a power. Okay, uh, your friends at uh, uh, when you go to CERN, you know, the people that are doing two plus one flavor, they have to do the same thing for a single flavor. And so, what happens is that uh, for the things that we have to calculate, you end up computing things. Uh, like, I don't know, let's say h squared minus dj sum on j uh, h, and there's a coefficient, say, nj. So you have to do sort of multi-mass conjugate gradient. It's just a technical problem. We should talk about it offline. It's messy. Okay, it's expensive. Okay, but you can do it. Okay? What's more important, though, is, I think, is the connection between five dimensions and four dimensions. Okay? So, this is very messy in the literature. It's hard to dig it out, but I can tell you what, but, but the domain wall people know this. Okay? So connection number one. Okay? If you take domain wall fermions with, uh, say, L sites in uh, the fifth dimension, okay? and then you integrate out the fermions in the middle. Okay, so I had my so here we have here we have my fifth dimension. There's uh, one chirality sitting here, there's the other chirality sitting here. These are the fermions that are mostly here, okay? And then I start integrating out all the guys in the middle to construct a low energy effective action. What I get is a four-dimensional Dirac operator which is, let's see, R0 over A uh, 1 plus gamma 5, let's call it epsilon tilde of H, okay? Where this is a matrix step function. It looks, it's a step function, right? Epsilon of H is something that looks like this. And it gets better and better as you make the fifth dimension tighter and tighter. You could have something like 1 minus H to the L minus uh, 1 plus h to the l, 1 minus h to the l, 1 plus h to the l plus 1 minus h to the l. This is an example of a step function, right? If h is a little bit, if 1 plus h is a little bit bigger than 1, then for large l, this is 1 minus 0. Uh, this is 1 plus 0. If it's the other way around, it's 0 minus 1. I mean, you, you get an approximation, okay? So you can integrate these things out. The other thing that you could do is you could say, I've got my fifth dimension over here. Let me calculate the low energy effective theory. Let me calculate the propagator for a fermion to go from, say, some place on the left-handed wall to some other place on the left-handed wall. I simply compute the propagator off of the left-handed wall back into the left-handed wall. And this was something Martin Luscher did. And what you discover is that the propagator is precisely the overlap propagator. So this funny, funny, funny relation from Ginzburg and Wilson, this is what these five-dimensional fermions are doing when you forget about the five dimensions and you do the fourth dimension. Okay? It's the weirdest goddamn thing. Okay? Okay, so good. So I can tell you, and then I'll talk about chiral gauge theories, which is even weirder at the end. What we know how to do. Yeah.
It's local, trust me. It's, kind of exponentially it's exponentially local. Could you repeat the, that? the question is, is that operator local? Okay, And uh, the answer is, it is not, we use the language ultra-local, that is, extends over one lattice site. Okay, that would be like the guys on the top row up there, right? You know, the naive fermion. These are what are called, these are called local operators. They are local in the sense that the range of the Dirac, the strength of the Dirac operator dies exponentially as you pull these guys apart. In the early days of this business, you would see pictures in papers. I have my formulation of the overlap and I'm tuning things to make it maximally local. Okay, that was an engineering thing. Uh, Mr. Lucier proved for sufficiently smooth gauge configurations uh, that, it, that it worked, okay? But that's an that was an issue when, when this stuff came along. Yeah, it's, it's like I was, I was listening to Slava this morning and he's talking about non-local. These are not non-local, they are just irritating, okay? But you get a lot for it. Okay, so what do we know? We know how to deal with vector gauge theories, okay? We know that five-dimensional edge states are domain wall fermions, and now you've seen it here, okay? So when you get a condensed matter person talking about things, you can translate. We know that in four dimensions, uh, you can get, you have a modified form of chiral symmetry, which I wrote down up there. Uh, topology, okay? You guys are doing churn assignments. I was telling, um, I was telling Greg, I went on Spires and I said, find T churn Simons uh, and T lattice, okay? And I found maybe four or five papers, and it's an extremely dubious subject, okay? A lot of, there, there was a paper by his brother, though. There's a paper by Greg Moore, uh, by, uh, by Guy Moore, okay, who was a famous simulator, okay? No relation, but <laughs> smart. There were, they're, they're smart guys, both of them, okay? Um, so this is an open area, okay? Uh, strong couple turn assignments. No, I mean, okay, wide open. Um, topology, okay, for a particle physicist. There's no perfect la lattice definition of an index from gauge variables. Maybe there is, but nobody uses it. There's no practical one. The things that we all do is we cook up some kind of fuzzy version of FF dual, okay, and we check it, and we know that if we had, let's be semi-classical, big instantons, instantons whose radius was bigger than a few lattice spacings, right, you could integrate it and you would get Q was equal to one and then all the disease is down around one lattice spacing, but that's cutoff physics, okay? And then people just go on. We are, we are practical people, okay? Uh, you could also get an index from counting zero modes from something like this, okay? Um, this is exact for the overlap. People do it for non-chiral actions. It's artistic, okay? Um, the lattice literature, the recent stuff, is mostly about engineering, okay? So not so interesting for you, but that's what, that's what we do. Okay, what we don't know, which I've seen in the, in the topological insulator literature, um, any analogs of uh, fractionalization, any analog of fractional quantum Hall physics in a five-dimensional context, okay? I mean, it'd be way cool. You know, you have some four-dimensional field theory that has emergent fractional, I don't know, I don't even know how to describe it, but I, you know, the, you know, you go out there and you stare at the stars. It would be something interesting to be able to do. I have no idea, idea if you can do it. If you can write a paper on it, though, remember my lectures because you have to explain it to people like me if you want, it, if you want us to code it up. Okay, that's another lesson. Okay, chiral gauge theories in five minutes. Okay, um, it's a big mess. Okay, uh, it would be very interesting to have a chiral gauge theory. Nobody knows how to do it. If you have non-chiral fermions, we can go back here. Okay, so you have something like this, okay? So this is your propagator right here, and if you look at the lattice action, so, so you've got stuff going on around P is equal to zero, okay, so where this is P mu. You've got stuff going, around, going on around pi, okay, where this is, minus, you know, this is pi minus P mu, okay? In the one case, you have a left-handed fermion. The other case, you have a right-handed fermion. These actions naturally double in parity, and they have, there's a theorem that the fermion that you want and the fermion you don't want, the mirror fermion, that they couple the same way. Okay? So you're stuck. So th but there are desperate people. They say, oh, let's break gauge invariance and hope for the best. I am not making this up. Okay? Uh, with domain wall fermions, you could say, well, I've got the left-hand guys here and the right-hand guys here. Can I somehow 
fuzz these guys out you know, and ignore them. Oh, by the way, there's a famous paper by Eichstein and Preskill, okay, who said, let's take the guys up here and somehow make them strongly interacting. And they form composites, and somehow they decouple. All very magical. Somebody actually studied that on the lattice, and it didn't work. Uh, there there's a reference in my notes. People did it. Okay. Uh, let's see. Over here. A couple of years ago, David Kaplan and Dorota Grabowska had a proposal which was basically uh, somehow you make the interaction of these guys with the gauge fields very fluffy compared to the interactions over here. Okay? And it was great for about six months, and then it got killed okay, by Martin Lucier, basically. Okay, so that one went away. I am not an expert at any of this business. I just tell you it is a famous unsolved problem. Okay? A lot of people are, by and large, it's not an active research field. It's kind of like proving Fermi's last theorem. Okay? Any idea you get is probably going to be wrong. Okay? And it's anyhow, you can already, it's outside of my pay grade. But it's an interesting, and it's an interesting question. I don't know how you would do it. Um, what I do, what, the one sensible thing that I can say at the end is, if you've got an idea for a lattice chiral gauge theory, you will have to code it up and show that it works. Because otherwise, nobody will believe you. Okay? But it's still an interesting problem. You, you, know, you could get a postdoc. You could do better than a postdoc, okay? uh, if you could come up with a solution to this problem. There would be a lot of people who are interested, but you're going to have to code it. Okay? That's all I can say about chirality on the lattice. I really want to watch the rest of the lecture series, okay? and I'm, I'll be looking for ideas, okay? because I think this stuff is way cool. But of course, you know, there's other way cool stuff here. Okay, that's it. I'm done. Any questions? Yeah, Slava. Yeah, so you said, okay, there are domain of thermos and it's different instance thermos, and they are kind of equivalent. So which one should, should we do? Should we forget about the label just because we're real sensitive? So that's, an, that's also an engineering question. Okay. He says, which. which which one should I pay attention to? Okay? And I would say that it's an engineering question. Okay? If you want to have, a, you know, these days, the people that do lattice simulations, they are not wedded to exact anything because there are so many things that you're trying to do all at once. Big volume, small quark mass, uh, small lattice spacing, you know, everything kind of working. And then it's an engineering question, right? I got to write a code. Can I write a faster code with domain wall fermions than I can with, uh, with direct Ginzburg with, with, with overlap fermions? Uh, and the answer to that question right now is that domain wall fermions are ahead in the game. Okay, so the, the big you know the big behemoths, who you know like you know who are doing you know very professional high statistics QCD are all using domain wall fermions because they can write faster code. Okay, and they live with the fact that it's not quite chiral because there's a lot of other things. You know, it's it's engineering. Okay, I have worked only with overlap fermions, and the reason is I have very poor social skills. And if there's only one person doing something, I don't have to check things. If I'm doing something like this, I have to check my ward identities. I have to check, you know, how much additive mass renormalization do I have? I have to check is the axial current renormalization factor different than the vector current renormalization factor? Okay, when you work with this things, you don't have to do it. But I have to say, uh, this is a place where I, I went full bore into this stuff like ten years ago, and I was wrong. At least I was not. I mean, everybody else went the other direction. But it's an engineering question. Okay, I would say there are things that five dimensions can tell you that the overlap cannot tell you. I would say that there are things that the four-dimensional formulation tells you that the five-dimensional thing is kind of obscure. Okay, I mean. Neuberger and, and, and Neri Annan, they had a whole series of papers and they would, they would look at things like the index theorem, right? They would, they, would, they would plunk something down and they had their overlap action and they would look at the spectrum and there would be zero modes and they would look at ward identities, right? You know, you would see that, uh, that chiral symmetry was exactly satisfied and it was all kind of miraculous. They didn't know about the ginsburg wilson relation, okay? It's like nowadays when you walk in and you say, oh, topological edge states. And then you don't have to give an hour lecture. Everybody nods. I mean, that's okay. That's not much of an answer, but that's that's the answer I can give you. 
Yeah, Max. Uh, can you take R naught to infinity? Uh, that not. No, I would I would say again I nobody does that, uh, but it's an engineering question. You know, when people do simulations with these things, see modern modern QCD actions uh, are much are people have been doing this for too have, people have been working in this field for too long. Okay, and so when I write down something like this over here with naive fermions, okay, these are free actions. So somebody could have said, how do you get the gauge field in? And you put the gauge field in basically by introducing link variables to make things gauge invariant. There's a bazillion choices for how you do that. There's a simple choice and then there are complicated choices. People pick something, you know, all you have to do is be in the universality class of QCD. And then the idea is how big, you know, it's an engineering thing. How big are my lattice artifacts? Okay. Can I make the length of the, dof of the domain wall 10 sites or 40 sites? If it's 10, I'm four times as fast. There's just all this engineering in there. And I think tuning this parameter is, it's just another engineering thing. I've never seen anybody talk about, let's, let's do all this stuff and then take the formal limit. Okay, A better formal limit, uh, what you want to do is take A over R0 uh, to 0 by making the denominator large. And I want to make A over R0 small by taking A small. And since I have to do that anyway right, for everything else, that's what I do. But, but these are engineering questions. OK, tomorrow I'm going to show slides.